Доброго дня, мене звуть Антоніна Кумка, я активіст, волонтер з Євромайдан Канада, а також президент новоствореної організації Canada Ukraine International Assistance Fund. Ми працюємо разом, нас багато волонтерів, які роблять усе, що можуть, щоб допомогти Україні, щоб допомогти українським волонтерам, українським військовим, цивільним, вийти з тої кризи, яка зараз є в Україні, і ми будемо продовжувати це робити, як можемо. If somebody wants to join uh, either Euromaidan Canada or uh, Canada Ukraine International Assistance Fund, uh, you can always find us on Facebook. You enter the name in the Facebook search and it comes up. Um, all of the information on uh, the projects, on the needs, on how to join, on how to work together or how to help financially, it's all there. So really there is, uh, um, if you're not on Facebook, that's fine. You can Google it. <laughs> you can Google Euromaidan Canada. You can Google CUIA fund. And again, it comes up right away. I try to do a lot of work for Ukraine and help the Ukrainian people in their struggle against the crisis and against the Russian aggression in Ukraine and all of those difficulties that they have to go through right now. I'm part of Euromaidan Canada. Euromaidan is one of the organ one of the committees or one of the organizations that is working towards supporting Ukraine at this time. I joined it when it was already created, but in the very, very first stages. So it was the students who initially created it and then the students sort of uh, withdrew because of their school and their commitments and other people joined and uh, it just keeps moving uh, from then on. The main goal initially was the Maidan protesters and then after that it changed to supporting people in Crimea and then after that the supporting soldiers in uh, the east and helping refugees and so on and so forth. There are many other people who are not part of Euromaidan committee who are doing a huge amount of work. Uh, they're not necessarily joining anybody, but they're just doing it on their own. And they're, they're well known in the GTA because of what they do. There are organizations that have been created during this period of time, such as uh, Army SOS, right? Uh, they, they've been mainly helping equip the army um, in terms of technical s things like uh, goggles, night vision devices, this and that. So I think all of the support that has been done, like Euromaidan Canada has raised more than a million dollars in, in uh, donations, in finance, financial donations and uh, in-kind donations. Uh, that all went to Ukraine to support the army and the civil, civilians, right? So it's been a huge help and it's just one portion of what Canada has done for Ukraine so far, which is a lot. Whenever uh, they ask me to speak, uh, I would speak and I would encourage people to not lose hope. I think this is one of the things that, that is uh, becoming a tendency right now. A lot of people are getting tired, exhausted, frustrated. They want to see the change to be happening faster in Ukraine. And it, it does have to be happening faster. I do believe that people on the ground, uh, the government, the president, the everyone who works with the government, like official state employees, they have to change their ways faster or give room to those who want to make those changes. Resign or and you know and say to volunteers take my spot. Of course they won't do it so somebody has to do it for them. Ukraine is changing and we have to adjust to that as well and I think it's important to, to uh, let people know that because I'm involved in this and I'm always in, in this mode and like reading, writing, uh, checking, communicating with people on the ground, I think I can uh, have some insight into that and if somebody asks me I will just say what what it is I think about that. As I was coming here actually uh, uh, there was a new report on uh, busting the employees of the prosecutor's office in Ukraine 
uh, $130,000 in cash uh, found in the room of one of the employees. Uh, diamonds, uh, other things like that, gold, you know. Um, they estimate this find uh, as uh, five, uh, around half a million dollars just in one room. You know, it's half of what we have raised in like a year and a half with Euromaidan, for example, you know. So if they continue doing those things, this is crucial. You, Ukraine needs to fight corruption and we are supporting it 100%. Canada Ukraine International Assistance Fund is basically the newly formed organization that's going to be focusing only on humanitarian initiatives. The children of uh, the refugees and um, the children of Donbass, the children of the victims of the war, the children of the fallen heroes of Ukraine, as well as the wounded uh, soldiers and civilians who need the help uh, at this time and who will continue needing help in Ukraine. It doesn't mean that the fund will on only be providing the support, like monetary support or just uh, one-time support at, at any point. It means that we'll be working towards building the capacity within the country in um, s helping these people get adjusted to life. For example, if um, when we were in Kyiv, uh, in May, we noticed that for, uh, the hospitals were not <laughs> were not amputee friendly at all. Like a, lo a lot of them, um, like the facilities, they it's difficult to for a person without an arm and a leg or or both to get around without somebody else helping because there are there is no accessibility. It's it's not like in Canada, and I think. Um, people can help, we can help them share our expertise, share our knowledge. I can facilitate it, but there are specialists who are willing to support that and uh, who are willing to work with the Ukrainian specialists on that and help them understand how to do that properly. One of the projects that did take place was the Ukraine Prosthetic Assistant Project that's uh, now going to continue uh, under the care of this uh, newly formed fund. This project will have the second round probably in about six months. Before that, we're, we're hoping to equip actually some of the hospitals with those basic assistive equipment, like grab bars and so on. That was actually the advice of the prosthetists from the US and Canada who went in May the first time of the prosthetic organization who suggested that this is something that they really need, something that they uh, would benefit from is are those simple things that would help people, you know, help themselves. So that's something that we're doing right now and then following that we're going to have another prosthetic project. <laughs> The stop of corruption in Ukraine, that's the biggest priority right now. If, if we speak about Canadian aid, it is all great. Any, everything is needed in Ukraine, right? Everything. The Ukrainian government keeps asking for lethal weapons to help fight the separatists to stop the war in the East altogether, stop it from continuing the way it continues now, right? Also, there is a tremendous need and support for the wounded soldiers, for the widows, for, the, um, so for, the, for their children. Um, it's not just uh, physical rehabilitation, it's also psychological rehabilitation because there has been, they've seen a lot of things and they've been through a lot of stuff. And this can all happen, like Ukraine needs expertise, Ukraine doesn't need really to send those people out or anything like that, I, I think. They need specialists who can teach them to do things on the ground, to build on, you know, and, but it has to be, they have to want that. They need to, they need to be open to that and say, okay, here we are, we want your uh, psychologists, we want your physiotherapists, we want your doctors to come and teach us and show us and so on and so forth. And this is also part of that corruption vicious circle where they need to, you know, they need to stop just thinking about the money and greed and look at a bigger picture, you know. 
basically everybody, everybody who lives there. It's important to give them a warning, and if they don't get it, they have to be, they have to be held responsible for what they do. If they feel that if I steal $100,000 today, what, what are my consequences, right? What am I, okay, so I'm gonna either get the money and go to jail, which is not gonna happen, or I'm gonna get the money and live happily ever after, which is most likely what's gonna happen. And when they weigh those options, and you, they know for sure that nobody's gonna do anything about it, then obviously they're gonna keep stealing. There's no way. Because it's, you can't go from making almost $10,000 at the customs a day to making 5,000 hryvnias a day, willingly, you know, it's just difficult. <laughs> It's not a secret, everybody admires Mikhail Saakashvili right now for what he's doing. <laughs> so I think his way is a pretty good way, you know. He, you need to bring in the people who are willing to bring the change. Otherwise the change is not going to happen because the old people, the people who have been there for a long time, for 25 years, they don't know any better. They're just going to do what they've been doing all along. Unfortunately, because this conflict has been dragging on for so long, it's become very stale, mate, and it, it does not attract that much attention of the general population anymore. So we are, we are concerned because we have Ukrainian roots, uh, but for an average uh, Canadian or American or anybody, it's not that much of an excitement or that much of a concern anymore because there are so many other wars in everywhere in the world, there's something happening, you know? Still, uh, we're able, we are able to find um, ways of, of, of um, getting things not just in the, inside the Ukrainian community, Ukrainian Canadian community, but outside. For example, there are other charities who do things for various countries, and, but they've never done anything in Ukraine. So we would approach them and would say, how about we help you and we facilitate everything and make everything, make everything work, but uh, you can, for example, give those wheelchairs to Ukraine this time and not just, you know, Haiti or other country. And then they would say yes, and that would be awesome. <laughs> and then uh, some other companies, um, again, they, they just, it just never crosses their mind uh, until you approach them and you ask them for something. It could be businesses, it could be charities, it could be anything else. And, but when you approach and you explain, and when they see that you have a plan, that you have, um, you have that vision and you know what to do with it, then they go ahead and help you. So that, that's happening. Ukrainian Canadian community is getting exhausted. It, like there is a sense of that, and uh, it's um, it's important to look somewhere else, to look for resources somewhere else. For example, if it's a uniform and they are asking for a uniform, uh, if we we know a place in Ukraine that's run by volunteers. When volunteers started it and now they're making those uniforms that are proper uniforms. They're much cheaper than something we would be getting here. All right, But they're still good quality and say if we need it fast, we'll just order it from them and, and they'll send it to the guys. If they're asking for something like really good quality that will last and it, do, it does not require, it's not urgent, then we can send it from here, buy it at a surplus store and, and send it, you know. Or things like, I don't know, they've, they've learned how to do many things there already, how to make them. Uh, like tourniquets, uh, they used to, we used to get them here for $40 at first, then for $16 a unit, you know. Now they're making it for 100 hryvnias in Khmelnytsky, which makes no sense buying them here anymore because you can get them there and there is no shipping cost and less time, you know. So it's, import it's important to talk to the experienced volunteers basically and see, because they know, they know where to get stuff, where to um, look for it, who to ask, and they'll, they'll be able to say who to go to for that specific item. We, we work with volunteers and we work with uh, units uh, directly with their commanders. Uh, we get their letters, they have 
d different means of communication, you know, could be on the phone, could be on Facebook, could be anything. It's, it's a chain, we've established this trust chain, people that we know, people that we can work with and we know that it's going to go where it's supposed to go and then that's how it works. Because it's dragging, right, it's, it's I think that if the, yes, if there, if there was a big action again, people everywhere would wake up. Uh, although we don't want that, but that's something that would definitely wake them up. Another thing is, if people would, if people saw more of what we saw today with the corruption busting, you know, and like what's what's happening in Odessa right now, what's the Odessa governor now doing? Like, if if there is more of that, it's it's an encouragement. When we get more reports that people are being held responsible, that the things are getting where they need to be getting, then people would be not so worried about wh why am I still helping, why am I still... And it's not that they don't mind helping, like it, they don't want help, right? They just want to switch that help to something else. Not buy stuff for the army anymore, because it's been a year and a half of supplying the Ukrainian army with things. But like help, like give that twenty dollars towards the family of the wounded, or give the give it to a, a kid, or bring the kids here, show them, you know, Canada and things like that, because it's it's like a an endless pit of uniforms that you you have to buy and buy and buy and buy, and they keep, you know, it's just hard. <laughs> I think uh, the Canadian government is doing a lot at this time compared to other countries for example unfortunately they can do certain they cannot do thir certain things separately from their allies which is uh, i think what stops them from like cutting russia off swift banking system for example or something like that they have to make it an organized decision with others because this is a big decision sending uh, non-lethal aid is up to Canada right it was up to Canada because uh, there was a decision made that every NATO country could do it at their own discretion so they did it at their own discretion but m more um, serious things I think the countries they have to coordinate and that's why that's where the the stop is. That's where Canada is. I think they're doing what they can at this point, as much as they can. There is pressure from the states, there is pressure from EU on Canada to not do more at this time. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah, like, for example, say if EU is not sending lethal weapons and then Canada goes ahead and does, it's, <laughs> it's politics, <laughs> you know? I don't know, I just feel that way. E EU, e they are too tied with Russia. There are a lot of connections there. They need to cut those connections first, and it does take time as well, you know? And then before they do that, I think there is no, there is no, not going to be that, you know, that's, one big thing that we all want, like SWIFT or lethal weapons or something like that. Um, another thing that, another message that, say, President Obama is sending is let's uh, affect Russia economically, let's just slowly make it, you know, go down. And maybe this is their idea, maybe they don't want to do more, maybe because they want to keep going at this pace and see what happens and, you know. We'll, we'll see. At this point, Canada has done a lot and can't say anything <laughs> against that, that's for sure.